Hello. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Winnie Yun, and I'm the uh, head of heritage of Tycoon. Uh, very warm welcome to our uh, second uh, Tycoon Conversations. Um, you are the lucky ones. Apparently, uh, it's sold out um, as of this morning, and so there are quite a lot of people outside waiting to to come in in a moment. Um, just to uh, just to give a very short introduction on what Tycoon Conversations is uh, to people who weren't here in, in the last talk. Uh, Tycoon Conversation is a very new attempt uh, to, uh, to have a conservation talk series uh, to invite um, uh, uh, professionals from not just from Hong Kong but overseas, uh, particularly in the regional um, uh, sector, to talk a bit more about uh, heritage conservation, in particularly uh, why we are conserving buildings. Obviously, we are inviting professional, and this is no intention to be turned into some kind of a professional talk because we do want everyone to understand more about heritage conservation and as the name implies, it's all about conversation. So uh, in a moment, Rupert will at the back right now, but uh, he'll, he'll come out and, and, and talk about Yangon. But at the same time, we do want you to, um, uh, we do encourage you to converse with him. So um, uh, have conversation with him to have uh, knowledge uh, exchange with him as well. Now all of this is uh, part of our initiative uh, for in terms of heritage conservation um, uh, in, in Tycoon. Um, and obviously we have, as you all know, we have conserved the 16 historic buildings and we built two new buildings including this one and turn it into Tycoon which is a center for heritage and art. Now uh, what we are doing with particularly with our department is to to, uh, obviously to um, uh, convey the significance and to celebrate the significance of this entire compound, which is always, I, I assume that all, all of you know that this is uh, a one-stop shop approach for law and order in Hong Kong where you have a police station, a magistracy, and a court uh, and a prison at the back. But it's more than that. Uh, what we want to do is, uh, aside from all these permanent and regular programs that we are celebrating all around the site, to talk about Tycoon itself, uh, we do want to use platform, uh, uh, Tycoon as a platform to talk about Hong Kong. Uh, we do want to celebrate Hong Kong, and particularly um, our, our, our neighborhood, uh, our, our culture and our identity as well. So this is where Tycoon con converse, uh, conversation comes from. So this is uh, really tricky for me to say. It's, um, it's a conversation about co conservation, um, and 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 it's in many ways trying to uh, allow us to provide you with an opportunity to actually uh, interact with uh, professionals uh, uh, around the region. Now, uh, I'm saying a lot, uh, partly because I do want to plug a few things. Um, uh, aside from all the regular programs, I hope that you're actually quite familiar with that we are having, um, uh, particularly uh, if you haven't been to Block 1, our headquarters block. Currently, we have a program called TK16, which is to, um, um, it's called 16 because we have 16 historic buildings, so every single thematic interpretation program is to uh, 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 delve into the, uh, the significance of each building and try to do a very small scale exhibition for you to go around the building and learn more about the building. Uh, we're doing one right now at headquarters block in block one. Uh, uh, it has to do with the fact that this building currently is uh, celebrating is 100 years old. So. It's 100 years old, but it's still relatively a young building. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, we're using that building to, to look into the extensive conservation work that we're doing there. So if you have the time, please go uh, take a look at the uh, TK16 uh, program that we're having right now. And uh, on this Friday, we're opening an exhibition uh, about um, one of our Lives in Central um, uh, exhibition. As I mentioned, we do want to talk further than just the significance of this uh, this historic site we want to explore more. So we're doing an exhibition called Let's Do Lunch. Uh, on, uh, we're opening it on Friday. It's part of our Lives in Central series. Uh, if you're, uh, if, uh, it, it, in terms of what we want to deliver is to look into the quintessential four elements of people's lives. So basically, um, um, in, 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 in sequences, clothing, eating, um, a living and transportation, yi sek ju han. So um, uh, let's do lunch is our second chapter. Uh, uh, we're doing this because we do want to look into what the, the dining culture in Central. Obviously, this is an old neighborhood. A lot of people have done exhibitions and tours about, about uh, Central's food. But we do want to look into the most important meal of the day. If, you're, if you live in Central or if you work in Central, your most important meal of the day is always the lunch. 
everyone when they go to work in the morning, they always think about what do they want for lunch that day because lunch in Central is chaotic, it's, it's troublesome, um, it, but at the same time it actually represents our, our, our culture as well. So we are um, uh, opening this exhibition on Friday. Uh, if you have the time, please come. It's also at uh, Block 1 uh, at the Duplex Studio. It's going to be uh, highly immersive. Um, um, I can't guarantee food. I, I know it's an exhibition about food, but I can't guarantee food. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, but there will be other programs where uh, and, uh, uh, circling the exhibition where we'll actually talk about the dining culture in Central. Um, I'm saying all of that, um, I'm, I'm taking away Rupert's time, obviously, um, but um, I, I think that uh, we do hope that, you know, this is our second one, and we do hope that everyone will actually keep coming back to Tycoon Conversations. Uh, we'll keep thinking about how we can actually um, uh, 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 work on our formats, uh, and, and this is a long, uh, ongoing program that we will all want you to continue to participate. So uh, thank you very much for coming, um, and uh, without further ado, I would like to inv invite Rupert Mann, who is uh, our speaker tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to, uh, to hear this talk. Um, thank you, Winnie, for that kind invitation and introduction. And thank you to everyone at Tycoon for uh, bringing me over. So talk to you. Um, welcome to my lounge room. <laughs> it's just like my apartment in Yangon, actually. If I'd known, I'd have bought my velvet jacket and my cigars. So my name is Rupert Mann. I'm a, I'm a built and cultural heritage specialist. I'm originally from Australia. Uh, I've been living in Yangon for about six years working with the Heritage Trust there. Um, I did a master's degree in cultural heritage management which, which looked at world heritage in the Asian region particularly. Um, and most of my work at YHT has focused on assisting the organization with really identifying their heritage assets in Yangon, uh, heritage lists, conservation area designations, and also how to manage the enormous development pressures that are currently um, coming to bear on Yangon and its built and cultural heritage. So tonight I'm going to tell you about uh, four main things. Um, I want to give you an overview of YHT's journey um, and its methods. Uh, how the organization has gone about doing its work, and perhaps um, examples of some of the key projects that we've worked on, uh, and try to share with you some of the lessons that we've, that we've learned at YHT. Um, I'm not sure if there's any parallels for, for Hong Kong. I'll, le I'll leave that up to you to decide, but I've tried to think about that. I'm not particularly familiar with the situation in Hong Kong, although YHC's had a long uh, association with the Architectural Conservation Program at Hong Kong University, so I've heard bits and pieces over the years through that connection. Um, so a couple of definitions at the beginning, because we, we talk about uh, conservation and we talk about heritage, but I want to let you know what, what I understand those things to mean. Uh, when, when I talk about conservation, I, I mean it in a very broad term. All the things that we do to try and understand and manage and protect the things that we've inherited from the past that are valuable and that we value. Uh, the memories, the traditions, as well as the physical things, the physical uh, places and buildings. When I talk about built heritage, I'm talking about things that we've created with our hands, physical things, uh, the built environment. And when I talk about uh, cultural heritage, I mean intangible things, the, the memories and the traditions and the activities that go on in those places that have significance and meanings. And really, when I, when I talk about Myanmar and, and Burma, these two things are kind of interchangeable. 
that. So the Yangon Heritage Trust. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to the organisation itself. It was found, founded in 2012 um, by a group of local people, led by Dr. Tham Yu on the on your left there, who's our current chairman, um, grandson of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and of uh, Uthan, former Secretary General, and someone who is very respected in Myanmar. Um, Do Mamo Lin, our, our conservation director, and Peter Mo Cho, our um, development director. These are these are local people. They're very much connected into the into the local community um, in Yangon. They're people who grew up in Yangon, have lived and worked in Yangon all their life. And YHC has a local staff of around 30 people. Um, they come to YHC because they're fascinated by its heritage and they, they want to do something to, to help. They're mostly young people. Um, they are architects and some engineers. Um, and YHC also receives a very uh, broad spectrum of support from a variety of people in the community uh, who come from business backgrounds and um, in the government. Uh, and YHT has always had this foundation of being locally formed and locally run, locally managed, which is a really important part of its um, its work. And over the years, we've received something like 40 different specialists who've come in to, to help us with our work. So we have uh, mostly technical specialists who come and assist us and, and work with us on, um, on specific projects and give us specific pieces of technical advice. So YHT is an NGO. We're a, we're a non-profit NGO. Uh, we are non-statutory. We have no uh, legal authority or power to to uh, instruct anyone to do anything. Um, what we do is advocate and convince. Um, we try to make the case for and guide and collaborate uh, conservation of Yangon's important heritage. It's funded around 60% by locals. So local business people and individuals who support YHT and its work. Um, and we have a very good working relationship with the city authorities. Um, and this really comes from our mission, is something that uh, a lot of people support and share in Yangon. In fact, a lot of people in the government also support it and share it. Um, and most importantly, we have the ability to tailor our advice and tailor our advocacy to really fit the local context, um, politically, economically, in terms of the administration. So the key things we do are identify uh, heritage assets. So we create lists and conservation areas. We advocate. Um, we try and convince uh, the general public and the government. We act as a bridge between different groups who haven't traditionally had a lot of um, um, attention uh, by the government. So a lot of local residents over the last 50 years in, in Yangon didn't really have a voice and YHT is able to speak to those people and try and feed some of that information back up. In fact, it, um, it sometimes happens within government departments. And we bring new ideas and try to set a new vision for the city. We look at trying to demonstrate financial models for heritage conservation. Um, and we do a lot of work on urban planning over the last few years. So we're actually trying to focus more on that. And um, we do a lot of training and capacity building. So I'm going to show you a little video. Let's hope this goes smoothly. So this is a little video about YHT. It will give you an idea of, um, of Yangon. And I don't know if, uh, how many of you have been there, but uh, this will give a little bit of background of our organization and a little taste of the city. I 
ဒါကောင်းတယ်အာဒါဟာစီပွားရေးဖွင့်ပြိုးလာဖို့ရှိတယ်ပြောင်းလဲလာတဲ့ဖြစ်စဉ်မှာခုမှာနှစ်ခု
uh, as in every country, uh, history is vital. Uh, if you understand the colonial history of Myanmar, you are really able to understand the UNU period of the 1950s when independence was gained. And you're able to understand uh, why UNU lost power in a, in a coup in 1962. And you're able to understand why the military ruled Myanmar for 60 years. Um, and you're also able to understand why it opened up in 2010 um, and why Duong Sang Suu Kyi came to power and the NLD, uh, who are currently leaders of the country. And you can really understand why the country is the way it is today. And it's really vital. It's a, it's a, first, um, it's a, it's a first step. And Myanmar was, was really drastically reformed by uh, British colonization. Um, this was a time when the, the British removed the king in 1885 and put in place an entire way of administering the country which came from outside. And that has been a, a moment that has echoed right through Myanmar's history to the current day and many of the politics and the administrative situations that we, that we see um, go back to that point. Myanmar then came under military rule for about half a century um, until the very recent elections in 2015 um, when the, the NLD, the National League for Democracy, won a landslide, a majority of MPs. And those 60 years had, a, had a, an absolutely profound impact on the country. Um, and the, the leader of the time, General Ne Win, tried to take Myanmar forward uh, with his Burmese way to socialism. And at the beginning, these days were hopeful and positive. Um, it became quite sour by the mid-1970s. Things were not going well. Um, and the, the economy uh, really fell away. The, the country became very isolated. Um, and disconnected from the rest of the world. Uh, whereas before the coup, it had, it had been a very, it had, even into the 70s, had been a country that was always very closely connected with the rest of the world. Um, in 1988, there was an uprising, and General Ne Win lost power. Um, this, this gov his government was toppled. Um, and in, in the following years, uh, the, the military who were able to take back power after 88 uh, really tried to show that they weren't that bad. And they opened up the country. Um, they did a lot of development. Um, they did a lot of beautification projects. And they reformed the economy. Um, and it was during these years, from really 1990 until around 2010, when about 30% of the heritage buildings in Yangon were actually demolished. And this, the impacts of these things, of colonialism, of, of socialism, and of military rule, have had a really profound impact on the country. And um, it's really my, my personal observations, having, having lived there for a little while, is that people had to learn a way to survive under those conditions, particularly under the, under the military rule of the last 50 years. Um, you really had to fend for yourself. Um, and you never stepped out of line. Um, there were entourages to, to be built. There were reciprocal relationships that had to be formed. Um, and plans had to be kept secret until they were done. And this, this is how people lived. This is how people survived. And, it, and it, it's, it's very important to understand that, to, to really understand Myanmar and, it, and its, its situation. This is how generations of people learn to live and to, and to um, survive, particularly in the bu bureaucracy, which is why I mention this, the people that we, that we work with. So when the government changed in 2014, only the very top changed. When the, when the NLD took, took power after the first uh, democratic elections, sorry, in 2016. That was early 2016. So these different uh, periods of Myanmar's history have, have had a big impact on the, on the uh, cultural heritage, the conservation of Myanmar's cultural heritage. And um, 
the military leaders really position themselves as champions of um, of uh, of what they called Myanmar culture, um, and in many ways, it's 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 difficult to put put your finger on this, but those years did conserve, I think, a way of of living and a way of relating, a way of uh, dealing with conflicts and resolving conflicts, and a way of doing business and a way of uh, of of living, um, which has changed in many urban urban centres around the world. Um, of course, this period did a great deal of damage to the country um, as well. And I think it's important to look objectively at these things, including with the built heritage. So the country was actually isolated economically for, uh, for many years, at least 20, 30 years where the economy was really uh, isolated and there wasn't much development. And in fact, um, in terms of the buildings that we have in Yangon, uh, it meant that the country avoided uh, the, the enormous development, uh, waves of development that happened in, in the region in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And uh, they, they didn't arrive in, in Yangon. They did arrive a bit later in the 90s, as I said. But um, this is one of the core reasons why Yangon and Myanmar has so much of its, its heritage intact. And it's important to understand that. So in 2005, the capital moved to Naypyidaw and Yangon was abandoned as the capital city. Um, and this is another really important point because it meant that Yangon no longer had to live up to being a capital city and all of the infrastructure pressure that meant and all of the symbolic pressure that came with that to represent something, to represent something culturally and in terms of nationalism. Um, and of course in, in 2010, uh, Dong Sung Suu Kyi, who had been under house arrest since the 88 uprising, um, was released and elections in 2012, and the country opened up. So visitors came from all over the world and tourist numbers jumped from 200,000 in 2009 to 1.3 million in 2015-2016. Uh, uh, international NGOs came from all over the world ready to get involved, and business people came. Um, corporate culture arrived in Myanmar, and the development community, the property development community, were, were waiting to see what would happen. Um, they wanted to uh, really know in those early days which direction was Yangon going to go. Uh, was it going to be another city uh, which allowed extreme high-rise development that didn't put in uh, strong controls to protect heritage assets in those early days? Or was it going to go in a different direction uh, and try and control some of that? There were several early property uh, d development proposals that went up to 40, uh, 40 stories in the historic city, in the core of the historic city. And um, at that time, there was really no regulation. There was no, uh, no law. There, there still is not much law at all, but there's an improvement but there was really no regulation. So in that context, precedent mattered enormously. Um, so this is the moment that YHT came on the scene, around 2012. That's the context that we were, were working in, a time of enormous political, uh, social, and economic change. The country was emerging out of 50 years of, of military rule. Uh, and with it came a lot of pressure to change and a lot of opportunity to to bring in wealth and, and generate wealth. And YHT had to somehow navigate that, that key moment. This was a fork in the road for, for Yangon. So in these early days, 2012, YHT was really finding its feet. And as I said, these were early. Uh, the people who set up YHT were, were very passionate. Um, people. They were not actually um, heritage specialists, uh, people with a lot of heritage experience, but they were people who were very passionate about the
the work. And you can see in this book, this is a very important first book, first attempt at sort of um, getting an overview of some of the key buildings and understanding their history. Um, the focus was really on individual buildings. So single, individual, large-scale buildings like this. You've got um, the, the former Accountant General's office there on the left and the Secretariat building on the right there. Um, so a lot of these buildings had been left largely abandoned after the capital moved to, to Napidor. Um, and the question was how to save them, how to stop them from being demolished. That was really the, the focus at the beginning. Several high-rise tower proposals came in for the downtown, 40, up to 40 stories. Um, and in, the, in that very early um, beginning, YHT was really successful in stopping some of those first precedents being set. And um, we, were not, uh, we were not responsible for it by any means. We don't, as I said, we don't have any, any um, legal power to stop anything. The government did this of their own accord and they deserve an enormous amount of credit for doing it. There were people who were very close to senior leaders in the country who ordinarily would have had a very smooth ride getting development done and some projects were actually stopped because of the implications on heritage, um, including a development very close to the Shwedegon Pagoda, which was, which was stopped because of its proximity to the pagoda. It, you can see it wasn't actually a high-rise development. It was, a, it was a low to mid-rise development. It was stopped because it was too close. So two important precedents, too close to heritage and too high. And these early... Um, examples were set in Yangon. Here we can see, I'm sorry about the quality of that picture, in the early days the government was trying to lease some of these big commercial properties, uh, these big historic properties for commercial reasons as well, uh, mostly for hotels and actually uh, a bunch of lawyers led here by Uko Ni um, protested and the government backtracked on that. So again, the conversation became about how to use them. The government wasn't sure how to use them, and the public was members, certain members of the public and certain groups were protesting about inappropriate use of those buildings. Um, and YHT was around by then, so we were actually asked to do conservation management plans for two of these buildings, which were the first such plans done in, in Yangon to try and set that that um, example. So what, very, what became very clear in that, really in that first year is that we had to go beyond buildings. We couldn't just focus on individual buildings if, if, this, um, if this enormously diverse and rich heritage was going to be conserved. Um, and really we had to convince the government. In those days, in those early days, it was still under a semi-military semi government. And so they were the first audience for us. So by around 2014, our, our work and our vision really started to expand. Um, and we knew that what we had to do was understand the city in great detail. And we had to create lists. So we had to identify every single building that we thought had heritage value. We had to apply criteria and we had to put them on a map, and we had to share that with the relevant authorities. Um, and this was a tool that we gave to the government. Uh, it continues. We're up to something like 15,000 plus buildings that we've assessed in the city. Um, and we also started to take an area approach, which is really vital, because there's so many um, parts of Yangon neighborhoods that are intact. So we really moved from this individual, this conversation about individual buildings, and we went to look at whole neighborhoods, whole areas. And this is the downtown conservation area that we proposed. Within that is about 2,200 um, buildings. And we identified this in, in a way that was defensible. So we had standard criteria that we developed within the organization, and, and we applied that 
in an even-handed way to come up with these buildings. So we had a defensible tool that we could give to the government. <clears throat> and of course, Yangon is, is one of the richest and most dense uh, areas in terms of its, its historic downtown city of, of religious diversity. There's um, Parsi, Sikh, Jain, Hindu, uh, all Christian denominations, uh, Sunni and Shia mosques. Um, there's a large Chinatown with several different temples, clan associations, um, as well as the local Burmese shrines and also the local Nat religions and Nat shrines that are throughout the city. So this was one of our key steps and this is what really, it was a really fundamental aspect of what we did and it's, it's so important when you're dealing with heritage is to, as an advocate, understand exactly what you have and where it is. And often that means just doing the work yourself like we did and giving it to the government for free. Often waiting for the, for the authorities to do it, uh, it, it takes too long and it's gone before it's done. So we set out to do it ourselves and we, we shared with the government a tool um, that they could use. And this was also about building a closer working relationship with the city. And they, they were grateful to have it. It's not binding. Um, but now how it functions is often when they get a proposal for a building that's on the list that we shared, they, they'll consult us. They'll send us a letter and say, what do you think? Doesn't mean they have to follow our advice. But that's the foundation of a good heritage management process in an urban context. That's the core dynamic that you have to try and develop. And of course, we did a lot of public outreach. We really had to um, understand how local people viewed their neighbourhoods and viewed their, uh, the challenges that they were experiencing. So we gave local residents Polaroid cameras and asked them to go and photograph what they liked and disliked in their, in their neighbourhood. And we came up with all sorts of fascinating responses that gave us amazing insights into how people see their neighbourhood. And we were able to feed that into our into our work. And what we kept hearing from the, from the business community and, as, and increasingly from the government was, this is all a good idea, but how do we do it? What's some achievable steps towards doing this? Um, and so we had to make the case for that. That was our, that was our responsibility. And acknowledging the enormous problems that exist, acknowledging the existing condition, we had to cre create and communicate a new vision for Yangon um, at, a, at a very high level and try to, try to create a new way of thinking about and seeing the city. Um, and the vision with, that we presented was um, Yangon as Asia's most livable city uh, through combining conservation and development. That was our vision. That, that is what we think we can achieve in Yangon. Um, if we can properly manage the city. So we went on to describe a city that actually was able to weave modern infrastructure uh, into, an, into and around the historic city. So it was a matter of combining uh, these two things, encouraging good development, retaining historic neighbourhoods, um, and highlighting what was existing in the city that was beneficial, the amazing green spaces, the cultural and the built heritage. The circular rail line, which was an is an amazing uh, transport asset. And we communicated this vision through our Yangon Heritage Strategy, which you can download online. Um, and when we first launched this, it was, it was downloaded thousands of times, our website actually crashed the day that we did it, and we're now into our third print run with this. Um, and it, it provided a new vision for the city, and it gave detailed actions uh, for how they could be uh, achieved. And it also gave a strategy for achieving it, which was tailored to the local political and administrative context. And another really key thing that we did, which is often overlooked, but it's very simple, we, we translated that document entirely into Burmese, and that's very rarely done. Uh, mostly th these um, strategies, these advocacy documents, these uh, a lot of reports that are done by large, well-funded agencies that come and work in Myanmar, they almost never 
uh, sorry, they, they always uh, do not translate the entire document into Burmese. There's usually an executive summary that's translated. And so the YHS was completely, every, every word was translated into Burmese, every graphic and every image. And so just by doing that, we reached an entire audience of people that had never been ad addressed in this way, had never been spoken to in this way. Uh, the ordinary uh, worker on the street could read this document, um, but also government officials who largely don't read English um, and wouldn't have the time to battle through a complicated um, English language document like that, although we tried to write it in simple English, wouldn't, wouldn't read it. So this was a really key aspect of, of, um, of communicating this strategy. And what we did was to focus on livability. Livability was our, our, um, our lens through which we viewed the city. It, it was what we wrapped heritage conservation in, in order to make it um, applicable beyond just saving buildings. And we defined livability as being about good public assets, um, being resilient in the face of climate change and disaster, <coughs> excuse me, being affordable, there being access to education and to health assets and health care, being economically strong, being a city where the public are engaged in the, in the civil discourse, that, that they have a civic pride and that they're involved in the planning process and decisions. Um, a compact city. We didn't want to see Yangon expanding endlessly. Um, a connected city that was easy to get around in, walk in, and, and with public transport. Um, a city that was under the rule of law. And this was a very important uh, idea that came around when the, when the NLD took power. Dong Sang Suu Kyi often talks about the rule of law. And that was an important concept that, um, that would standardize and provide a level playing field. With diverse communities, the religious diversity that I talked to you about before is reflected in a, in a very diverse range of communities and um, a city that retained its unique heritage, built and cultural heritage. So this was uh, a vision for the city and a way of characterizing its success that would uh, link in with a whole lot of people. And importantly, the answer to this um, had to be urban planning. It was no longer about saving buildings. It was no longer particularly about um, uh, restoring heritage buildings, although that is a very important part of it and a key aspect to it. But it now became a question of urban planning. That's how you tie all this together. This is the best profession, the best skill set to try and tie all this together across an, an urban environment. And we had to define what good urban planning was and we continue to do that. Um, so how we can combine uh, high-rise areas with low-rise historic areas, how we can bring in sympathetic, harmonious new development into historic districts. And the strategy presented was kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people that we were working with at the time. Um, but it was basically to ignore trying to reform the law, ignore trying to change regulation kind of put the cart before the horse and say, actually, we have to sort of pretend that the regulation is there and behave as if it was there and try to do some real-world demonstration projects. And then if there's an appetite on the government side to say, oh, this is pretty good, how do we repeat this over the rest of the city? Then we can maybe start to talk about regulation and start talking about changing uh, laws and things like that. So this was our, our strategy. And importantly, YHT was able to take advantage of the, the newly arrived democratic process. So we actually wrote this Yangon Heritage Strategy for the new government um, in the lead up to the, to the elections. In early 2016, they took power. And um, we tried to communicate to politicians and, and MPs uh, that this was a way that they could take care of their constituents and their communities. And that, that uh, democratic dynamic of people being elected based on what they promised to do uh, is a very new little dynamic in Myanmar. And it was, it's very interesting to, to try to operate within that 
within that context. So then we moved to a phase really after the uh, NLD came to power and the new government came to power in, in 2016, so during 2017, up until today. What we really try to focus on is, um, is demonstrating these benefits, undertaking pilots, um, and continuing to expand our focus. Um, so with the with the Yangon Heritage Strategy in, in place um, and with good working relationships with the, with the local government there, um, with a solid understanding of the city and its heritage assets and, and how the community, the local residents, at least in the downtown area, felt about it, um, YHT was really ready to begin implementing some of this and doing, doing some real-world demonstration projects. So we identified two, two major focus areas for us that we continue to work on. The first was how we could uh, look at public realm upgrades and actually move away from focusing on the, on the, uh, the, the private property, say, outside the public realm, and look at the street, um, which is really a key part of any conservation effort in a city, but it's, it's actually often uh, ignored, not really looked at by, particularly by heritage advocacy groups such as YHT. Um, so we wanted to create new designs and new ways of using and looking at the public realm. So we did that. Um, and how the community are able to, to use and connect with public space in the, in the historic city. Um, and so based on the Yangon Heritage Strategy, we found that actually a lot of international agencies were starting to use that as their first, their first point when they were designing projects that they wanted to um, do in, in Yangon, which was really fantastic. It took away a, a lot of the work that would come later on trying to, trying to tailor it to the, to the context in Yangon. And now there's, there's quite a lot of um, interest and some projects that are coming up. Uh, funded by international governments, looking at actually investing money into upgrading large sections of street and public realm. And secondly, we had to find a way to unlock the economic potential, particularly, we, we focus at the moment, particularly on government-owned buildings. So there's an enormous amount of um, underutilised historic government buildings that, that are sitting largely unused. So we had to think, how can we actually begin to use them for some sort of um, commercial use to generate an income uh, for the government or f perhaps for a fund um, and uh, how to use them also for cultural uses to make sure that the public could access them. So this area is something that received a, a big boost recently and we had an Italian funded project that we worked on and we took one single building uh, and we went in there with, um, with uh, in partnership with the regional government um, and we went in there with real estate specialists and engineers and architects, um, people who could value the, um, the income that could be generated through rental on that property. Uh, and we, we looked at a particular government-owned building and we had official support to do that, which was the first time that had been done. So this was a really important first step. And what we found was that the building was strong and it could generate a good income and that people were interested in it. They wanted to invest money in it. They wanted to use it. Um, and that it could uh, form a new way of looking at, at heritage buildings. Uh, that uh, there's particularly these historic government-owned buildings that had, had really been left to, um, in some cases, uh, form a home for, for pigeons and rats, and that was about it. They'd really, a lot, a lot of them had really just been left when the government moved to Napidor. So what we really want to do with the, ne the next step for this is try to set up some sort of mechanism um, that allows an income to be generated and for some of that income to be fed back into a fund that could then be used to support public, further public realm upgrade, um, further uh, conservation of, of government buildings, or that could be used as a perhaps a chat for chat fund, um, like a dollar for dollar fund for uh, people who have historic apartment blocks or small buildings that they would like to restore. So 
um, critically what we've done is make the economic case for this and we've shown that it's feasible and that it's that it that it works and so we we hope that this fund can be established and there's interest in the government and we're we're trying to do that but it's a very complicated thing to do in a in a in a country where that sort of thing has not really um, happened yet although there are PPPs that are uh, going on public-private partnerships that are happening in Myanmar, not yet with historic buildings. So another um, another key aspect of our vision for Yangon is that really it, it has to be first and foremost for for local residents, and um, it's a, it's a very difficult balance to strike: um, commercialising, semi-commercialising these buildings and also re retaining the authenticity of those neighbourhoods and allowing uh, the kind of people who live there now to continue to live there. We're lucky in Yangon in that a lot of the people that live in the historic city are, are generally mid to even upper income level. So these are people who can actually invest in their, in their buildings, but they really don't know how to, and they're not confident that the, the building can be repaired. So a lot of our work is, is training on that. Um, so this is a very, very hard thing to do, and we're, you know, we're not at all confident that we can do it, but it's part of our vision, and we hope that we can achieve that. So the other, the other, the other aspect is um, is public realm upgrades. So actually, the um, the public realm in Yangon is in very bad condition. Uh, all of you who have been to Yangon have probably narrowly avoided falling down a drain or tripping up on your way somewhere. So this is pretty common. This is a pretty common scene in Yangon, and there hasn't been a lot of investment in, in footpaths and public realm. Um, and in around 2013, the government lifted all the tariffs on cars. So a car that used to cost about $100,000, suddenly overnight cost about $20,000, and the roads were flooded with cars. Um, there, was, there was no uh, infrastructure put in place before that, no, traffic, the traffic lights in many cases are still police manually doing it, just having a look down the road to see how much traffic there is and then changing the light. And um, that's still the case in a lot of parts of Yangon. So the roads were suddenly flooded with cars and um, YCDC, the Yangon City Development Committee, which is the city authority, responded by removing uh, the footpaths to try and get parking off the, off the carriageway. And... Um, here you can see, this is 1983, uh, Yangon had, had enormous wide footpaths in, in many places up to eight metres wide and now down to one or two metres wide and parking uh, there instead. So a big part of YHT's work is, is trying to find a balance in between those two things now. And the footpaths that do exist are very much overburdened. Um, there, there's a lot of competition between street vendors and parking, um, generators, utilities, aircon units, and a little bit of space left for pedestrians to, to make their way through the city. And really what we, what we have to do is try and find a balance between these things because street vendors particularly are a very important part of, of Yangon's culture and its heritage. And they're a part of what make the city livable because People like living in the downtown, we discovered, because it's so convenient to go to the end of the street and get whatever you need and have a snack and, you know, go here and there and get everything. It's, uh, it's a big part of why people actually like living there. So we have to try and find a balance and try to manage vendors and try to, uh, try to divide up the public realm in a way that, is, uh, that works a bit better. So during the life of this current government, YHT is really focused on this and trying to provide some simple, uh, well thought out plans that are workable and practical, um, that retain street vendors in the, in the footpath. Um, and this is coming from the YHS. We proposed a, a, a walking route going through four historic pagodas through the center of the city that could form a sort of pioneering spine down through the city. Um, and we've been trying to make this uh, something that we can that we can find investment for, and hopefully we will be able to do that. And really, because of YHT's established relationship with the with the city authorities, we were asked 
at the beginning of this year to um, kind of unexpectedly, and things often happen in Yangon unexpectedly, we, we were asked to provide um, a design, a concept design for a street upgrade of a particular street. There were funds ready to upgrade the street and they were going to do it how they usually do it and um, they asked us for our ideas. So we, we produced the concept um, and we put forward something that was quite ambitious. Um, this, is, this is actually the design that we propose, which is just currently uh, coming to completion. It's, al it's almost finished. Um, but it in involved a lot of new things like uh, standard curb heights and um, safe curb radiuses. Uh, for turning circles in cars, gutter improvements and uh, drainage management and permeable footpaths that absorb the rain rather than exacerbating flooding by, by, uh, by having poured cement, um, looking at street furniture and standard bin designs, um, looking at re-expanding the footpaths and actually giving some of this back to local residents and local community to sit and enjoy rather than um, having to battle their way around the city in these um, places and also urban greening. So we increased the number of trees in this street by seven or eight hundred percent and um, we put in standard standard tree pits uh, and chose good trees that, that don't have invasive root systems and that uh, have good uh, shade coverage. So these are these were new new ideas and new concepts, and the city jumped at it to their absolute credit. And they uh, this was paid for by uh, out of uh, government funds. And so we've now been working for I think about four or five months on this, and we're there almost every day working with the tradesmen. These tradesmen have never done a lot of this stuff, and so it's a matter of building the tools to get the right. Um, uh, to get the right shaping on the curbs, it's a matter of building the formwork, it's a matter of um, you know, how to lay pavers and do proper bedding for them, um, proper substrate. So this has been an, an enormously um, influential project and really what it's, um, what it's doing is local people, uh, MPs, the city authorities are starting to visit this street and actually walk down it and um, a range of, of um, you know, the general public and businesses um, are now asking for these streets to be built in their areas. And it's the perfect moment for that to happen. The city is making uh, funds available um, and it's really uh, changing the way that people view their city and view the street. It's, it's, it's providing a new frame to these historic buildings and a new way of accessing them. You know, when, I, when we see people walking down this street, they're not looking down, you know, wondering where's the next open drain I'm going to fall into. They're relaxed and they're wandering along the street and they're looking up and they're looking at the buildings and they're reconnecting with that heritage because they don't have to worry about uh, where they're stepping. And it's enormously beneficial. Um, and watching the way people use this street has been uh, really joyous to see people reconnect with their public realm in a completely new way, in a different way. So our work from here is really now about building on this. And, um, you know, we've YHC, I think, has taken an unusual path for a, for a heritage advocacy group, and our, our, our scope has really expanded exponentially. And I think what we do is, is considered um, and is usually beyond what uh, even some of the best funded government agencies do in terms of heritage conservation. And um, what, what we, um, uh, you know, what we want to do is continue to focus on that, on that urban design, um, on that advocacy, um, you know, historic research and regulatory reform. Um, and I think we're able to continue to act as a, as a messenger between a bridge between different groups of people um, that ordinarily wouldn't, wouldn't have a strong voice. Um, and as I said, sometimes this happens within government. So MPs come and say something or very senior people within a government department will have a particular idea. It's very difficult for junior staff or others to, to offer a different idea but they can offer it to us and we can kind of transfer it up. And that's a really, that's another important role of YHT. Um, 
So, as I said, there, there are some, some really uh, large-scale investments coming into the city in, in terms of the public realm, which is very exciting. So we hope that this kind of approach uh, can, be, can be expanded much further across the city. Um, and we want to continue to try and create a, uh, a regulatory framework. This is a very long-term process, but, you know, we, we want to create a set of urban planning goals and even an urban plan for Yangon. Um, a government mandated strategy for heritage conservation and and um, urban planning and a new vision for the city that is officially mandated our Yangon heritage strategy is not official doc document at all um, and we want to put in place uh, new laws um, for heritage conservation so identifying actually putting those conservation areas in place and having uh, design guidelines, having height controls for those areas, uh, guiding uh, new buildings within them, um, and to really build the capacity of the city to be able to take on a lot of this responsibility and, and do this work themselves um, so that they can manage that heritage and continue to consult the heritage lists and try to protect buildings. Um, and hopefully to try and conserve those communities that exist in those in those places and at least allow them the chance to continue to live in ways that they have lived in if they want to and if that's what they're um, if that's where they naturally go certainly you 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 can't freeze a city in time at all and YHC would never want that um, Yangon has to be a modern city and it has to have all the benefits of that um, but it also has to try and retain that unique that unique heritage. Um, there's many challenges in Yangon, and I think we'll continue to struggle with um, with getting standard processes in place. And um, we're still losing heritage buildings as we speak. Small scale buildings are coming down, although the large scale buildings are not being demolished. Um, but I think Yangon is not seeing anything, and I don't think it I don't think it will see anything like what places like Bangkok or Kuala Lumpur or Manila saw in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, I think Yangon has, has, um, has avoided that. There have been no major demolitions of really important historic buildings in Yangon. As I, as I said, we've lost some, some little ones. Um, there's a functioning informal heritage uh, listing process and the public realm is now being improved. Um, the government are really willing and interested to look at new ideas for, for how to manage the city and the public realm. Um, and heritage conservation and particularly public realm upgrade are now, uh, again, a, a little electoral issue in that new dynamic. The elections are coming up next year. So um, now MPs want us to put these uh, street upgrades in their areas. They know that this is a good way that they can demonstrate that they are actually um, uh, listening to their community and doing good things for their community. And they are actually doing good things for their community by, by doing this. Um, so it's, it's very interesting for us to try and navigate that little, that little process, which is brand new in, um, in you know, one, of, one of the region's, if not the region's youngest revived democracies. So I think YHT was, was really very successful in, um, in advocating and assisting the government to make some very important decisions in those early days. Um, and I think that the, the huge economic pressures that came to bear in Yangon were, were resisted in, in, in some way. The opportunities that were there were resisted in some way to try and step back and say, is this actually what we want to throw ourselves into? And um, this is really quite remarkable, I think, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, this, in this part of the world. A lot of cities, as I said in the past, didn't make that decision at the beginning. And Yangon was really this, the, the, perhaps the last major historic city that was also a major economic centre that, that could perhaps navigate that that dynamic somehow and, and navigate that very complicated set of issues to try and find a balance. Um, so I think it's all been good work. Um, it's been a real privilege for me to work there for, for six years and see 
you know, how it works as an outsider and in some ways as an insider in working in YHT. Um, certainly an outsider to the country. I'm obviously not Burmese. And um, thank you so much for your attention. It's been a real privilege to speak to you this evening. And thank you so much to the Taekwon team and to, uh, to Winnie and Arthur and uh, everyone for, for really uh, bringing me over and allowing me to talk to you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you once again for our speaker tonight. I um, just want to, um, we're going to open some questions on the floor. Yes, please, um, if you have if any questions. anyone got a question to ask our speaker tonight? Uh, which part do you think the most difficult uh, to persuade the local government or encourage the government to uh, to follow your, your idea? Because uh, as I know, uh, many people, Many countries in, in the East, uh, like China, their uh, fundamental perception or concept about uh, how to protect the heritage is very different from the Western country. Like, uh, as I know, uh, in China, uh, in some uh, province, that um, their concept is how to protect the heritage is to demolish the old one and to rebuild a temple and to uh, claim that uh, this is the temple with thousand years history, something like that. So what do you think uh, if there is the same situation in Burma? Yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a different perception of, um, of the importance of fabric. And uh, in Myanmar, that's, that's true. We found that in Bagan. Actually, I wrote my thesis about Bagan. And there, a lot of the temples were restored in the 1990s but they're still considered ancient temples. They're considered as an ancient landscape and a functioning religious site. So there's, a, there, yeah, there's differences there, but I think in terms of the most difficult part, it's the regulatory side. So that's why we avoid it. There's no, there's no, we, we've got a lot of work. We've done a lot of work. We've got a set of proposed regulations that are ready to go, but unless there's a political appetite to push it and to, to do it, there's, there's no point in getting tied up in, in, in worrying about it. And there's certainly um, no point in waiting for it to happen before you do anything else. So we sort of move ahead as if the regulations are in place. And we try, like with this street, we try to sh meet all the international standards of a safe street with curb heights, um, with gradients, um, with universal access for disabled people and the elderly. And we, we behave as if the regulations are there and we hope that when people come and look at this, they think, oh, this is a good idea. So how can we, how can we repeat this? How can we multiply this? And we can say, well, here's a set of regulations you might consider putting in place. So yeah, the, the regulatory side, I think, is the most, the most difficult, particularly in a climate like Myanmar, where it's, it was, it's a very hierarchical government process. Um, it's very difficult to change that. It's very difficult to, to change those processes. And politically, it's just very difficult to, to introduce new, new regulations and, and, um, and laws. Uh, in, some, in some ways, it's simple in that there is the, you know, it's very top down. But to actually make them have an effect in the real world is, is more difficult, much more difficult. Yeah. So I think that's the trickiest part, trickiest part for us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any more questions? The one in the middle? Um, yeah. Hi, thank you for your um, sharing. I'm very curious in Myanmar and in Yangon in particular, um, are there universities or any vocational training that are developing talents to survey these sites? Uh, because I, I remember you said that there are thousands of buildings your organization survey that takes quite a lot of manpower. So who are doing it and are there like in, in um, continuous stream of young people who are joining this force uh, to contribute to the heritage conservation in the country? Yes, there are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we work quite closely with the, um, both the archaeology department and the architecture department, Yangon University, and there are technical universities as well in, um, in Yangon. 
and actually we we're we're trying to uh, set up a particular program with the um, with the technical school technical university which is um, technical university in the very old sort of British sense uh, for tradesmen and tradespeople to actually learn skills in dealing with lime plasters and lime mortars and brick conservation and how to repair historic buildings and timber and uh, iron work and things like that uh, in caustic tile repair. So one of the things YHT does is quite a lot of training on that aspect and we'd love to, we're really very actively trying to set up a program with the, with the technical university in Yangon so builders can learn that. And in terms of students that come, yeah, lots, they come and, they, they come and help us and we work with them on different programs. Um, the architecture program at Yangon University now has a module on heritage conservation that myself and our YHT's director, Dom Momo Lin, have been teaching in. So that's, that was the first year they did this, did that this year. Um, and it was kind of sudden uh, that, we were in, that we were asked to do that. So hopefully next year it will be much more structured and we'll be able to build on that. Yeah. There's a lot of interest in, in Yangon with, with young people particularly. I think they see this heritage in a different light. Mm. Thank you. Um. Thanks. Um, it's a question more about how does uh, YHT kind of intersect with the identity of Yangon. Obviously Myanmar is a very multicultural place and over the last two years, not to get political, has gone through a reassertion of different identities. Um, things like Shwedagong and Sule must have administrative or theological kind of colleges that are looking after their heritage. So how do you interact with the populations, the communities to kind of say, this is the cultural heritage and this is how it interacts with the built environment? Mm. Yeah, it's... Um the the situation that you that you refer to is is really not the case in in Yangon. So in 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 northern Myanmar, in Rakhine State, that's a very distinct situation. Um, in Yangon, that's really not the case. So there there's a huge diversity of different religious groups, and historically, there's there there have been times when um, the Chinese communities and the Indian communities were were targeted during the military period in the 60s. Um, and that was really a response to, again, British colonialism and the way that those communities had a presence in Yangon. But today, there's there's really um, there's not conflict in Yangon, and there's people that have enjoy all sorts of different um, food, all sorts of different um, ways of uh, working with each other and resolving conflicts and coming up with ideas from different cultural backgrounds. Um, and in terms of the the buildings themselves, they're, they're like you, you mentioned, the pagodas. Yeah, they have their own trustees and, and usually the, um, the mosques or, the, or the, um, the churches or the temples also have their own trustees that, that uh, take care of those buildings. Yeah. And how do you interact with those trustees? Or uh, well, we, yeah, well, we, we get... Um, we really are responsive when it comes to building. So we don't go out and in, in, in almost all cases, but we don't really go out and, and identify something and say, you know, please repair this or you should repair this. We have, I think we're up to something like 200 individual buildings that we've worked on since our, since our founding in some detail. And we, we get people come to us. So we've worked on mosques and we've worked on Dravidian Hindu temples and we've worked on several churches. Um, not pagodas. Pagodas are their own, really their own thing in Myanmar, um, and the 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 sangha, the monks, take care of that very, very closely and very well themselves. Um, although some prayer halls we've worked on um, in Yangon. Um, so when they come to us for advice, we we offer it and we give it a technical advice. And one of the things we did um, to try and introduce uh, local people as well as international visitors to the religious diversity of Yangon's downtown was we, we run a, um, a tour program uh, which focuses on religious diversity. So we go to five or six different um, different places of worship, pagoda and a Chinese temple and a um, mosque, um, a church and a synagogue. 
which still exists. There's no longer a functioning Jewish community in, in um, Yangon, but the synagogue is still there. So we, um, yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not the kind of issue that it is in Yangon as it is up, up north. Um, if it was, it would be a very different situation in the city, and we would, I think, have to address that much much more closely. But Yangon is, uh, YHT is really focused only on Yangon. We really only work in Yangon. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, maybe one last question. Um, in the middle? Hello, uh, Rupert. Hello, Thank you very hi. much for your sharing. Um, Thank you. Particularly glad that you talk about the importance of urban planning because it, it yeah. uh, really sort of controls the big picture, right? right. Um, but you haven't mentioned much about ownership, right? When you plan, you have all the all sorts of zoning regulations, and yeah. you control people's development right. Right. So how yes. do you go about it? You are just uh, I mean, not you are. I mean, YHD is just a. Yeah. Uh, an NGO, yeah. and how do you get along with these, uh, you know, land owners or building yeah. owners? Yeah. Uh, and how would the government um, listen to you? Do you yeah. engage not just the government, but also you rely on the community to support this mission? Yes. So uh, my main question is ownership. You know, how do you control? I mean, how do you convince the owners? to yep. go along with your urban plan. Right. Yeah. Very complicated issue. And particularly in Myanmar. So there's a, there is an existing heritage list that's informal um, that was created in the mid-90s. But it only looks at large-scale government-owned buildings and religious buildings. And it completely avoids the issue of private property ownership. It's a big hurdle for us. Um, the whole idea, I think, um, in many ways culturally in Myanmar, but certainly in, in terms of administration and the way that, that has worked, um, it's quite difficult for the government to really impose too much on private property, even though from the outside many people might assume that was the opposite in, in Myanmar with its history of, uh, coming from a military government. But actually the, the government is very reluctant to do that. And I think the... The way, of course, in heritage conservation, you're always going to come across situations where the owner wants to demolish a building and build something that's, you know, 20 stories higher. Uh, and through some sort of listing process or protection process, they're not allowed to do that or not allowed to do it to the extent that they wish to. And I think when, when that point comes, the question has to be, uh, do you make a decision that is beneficial to that individual or do you make a decision that is beneficial to the city as a whole and i think that's what it boils down to for me anyway and i think it it takes it takes bravery on the part of the government um it takes dedication um and it takes making defensible decisions to say that actually this heritage is worth a lot to the city in terms of its livability in terms of its um its communities in terms of its economic health. And if we do continue to lose these buildings one by one, the entire city is going to suffer. It's going to lose something which sets it apart from other cities in the region and gives it a competitive edge moving into the future, um, where many other cities didn't retain these buildings and didn't retain this heritage. If Yangon can do it and also modernize, then you've got something that's really quite unique in the region and that will be very valuable. So it's, it's a difficult point. I think I'm not speaking for the government, um, but yeah, you, you definitely come to a point where there's a direct conflict. I think it happens less, less often than people might think. Um, you know, I know m my experience in other contexts is that you know, we, where there are robust planning processes is that um, you know, in, in Melbourne, where I'm from, I started with a um, um, heritage advocacy group and they went to list 189 buildings. And I think there were five or six owners who objected. Uh, most of them are actually happy to have their building listed and protected, even though uh, when this was in the CBD, right in the, in the CBD of the city. Um, but I think there is, yeah, there, there, there will definitely come a point 
and it will have to be addressed in the in the political moment and I'm not sure how it how it will be but I think that's for me that's the question is um, the individual benefit versus the the benefit of the entire city if we accept that heritage is something that is that is valuable and that is worth re retaining yeah <coughs> Hi, um, I actually have two questions, it's fine. <laughs> um, one is, um, there's one concept that you constantly brought up in your presentation is to keep to, um, the, um, maintain the heritage and also provide the people with um, um, modern life and the, your organization, well, uh, YHD is a strike for the balance between the two. And uh, the example that from the urban design that you keep to a street vendor and along with the um, parking and the, the footpath is, uh, is a great example. Um, just, um, and also, I um, just want to ask you from an uh, archaeology background, and have you ever encountered any um, struggle that, you know, preserving the archaeology asset of the building while um, um, the other is the demands of the people that want to um, get upgrade their, their facility for more modern life and whether you have encountered um, the obstacles in balancing those two. And the second question is, um, it's very admirable that uh, a team of 30 people have done so much in six years and even to recording the details of the thousands of heritage building in details is a very label demanding work. And um, I was in um, Yangon four years ago and I signed up for a heritage tour and that guide and now I think back maybe an ambassador of, for, I mean, I don't know, ambassador of your um, organization. And so I'm wondering whether you have some voluntary, uh, volunteer like program, and if so, like how, what kind of activities that you do? You mean do we accept volunteers in our? Yeah, in our yeah. And how do you um, recruit them, and uh, what kind of um, uh, program that uh, uh -huh. arrange for the volunteers? Or, Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we do. We we um, we take volunteers. We've got quite a few local volunteers, usually young students who are in their holidays who come and work with us and do little discrete jobs. And we also take interns from, from overseas, usually for a bit longer. Um, so yeah, we do, we do work with a lot of volunteers and there's a lot of people who are interested in working with YHT and we encourage people to, to contact us if they're interested in doing that. And um, your, uh, your other question, in terms of um, archaeology, you were asking about archaeology? Yeah, so my, my very beginning in heritage was in archaeology. I was a field archaeologist for the first few years of my career in heritage and um, haven't been in the dirt for a long time, though. And, uh, yeah, we do, we're very aware of, of archaeology in, um, in Yangon. Uh, actually, the, the current... A British gridded city is built on uh, about two feet of fill, and under that is the uh, Alangpia's ancient city that the British actually took. Um, and so that city is really uh, there. And what we do try to put in, uh, encourage, and we we were able to do one excavation actually a few years ago, is that um, a salvage uh, operation should be done in a site where there's significant heritage and the foundations are going to go down and destroy the archaeology. It should be salvaged first. It should be investigated and salvaged first. So that's something that's very, very important for us. And I, I think the other question you asked was about um, how to reuse historic buildings, was it? Were you asking about that? And uh, can we, can we, how, how residents can reuse historic buildings. That, that was something that we also do a lot of work on and modernizing buildings so that they can live in them and use them. That's really important because actually a lot of, um, a lot of local residents who live in these historic buildings that haven't been upgraded for a long time um, assume that they're unsafe because they look, uh, they look pretty uh, filthy actually. Uh, lots of trees growing out of them and bits falling off. And actually, they're usually pretty strong, um, and it's a, it's more of an aesthetic problem. 
and putting in place good plumbing and a good kitchen and um, making it a comfortable space is a lot of the work that we advocate and, and do and we train and we work with architects and engineers and tradespeople to show them how to do that in a very practical sense. And I often spend a lot of time on sites, you know, we, we go and we actually train them how to mix lime, mar lime plasters, um, how, to, how to repoint bricks, how to repair bricks that have been damaged, um, how to repair terrazzo, how to, how to repair um, encaustic tile floors. So that's a big part of our work as well, trying to show them that these buildings can actually be modern and, and livable, and they're usually better than the modern ones. They've got higher ceilings, they've got thicker walls, uh, the layout is usually better, um, they're somehow adapted to the climate uh, in a way that modern, modern buildings tend not to be. And they're often much stronger, much stronger. The, the, the construction techniques were much more robust than modern construction techniques that are being used in Yangon today. So they're, they're much more resilient buildings. There was recently a small earthquake in, in Yangon and um, uh, a lot of the newer buildings are the ones that had the problems. They were settled into the, in their foundations and they cracked and moved and, um, yeah. All right. Thank you very much.